so easy to love, so easy to analyze. All lovers have so the yearning for the Linda opened her house and her heart to my family, particularly my eldest son. 
and the friendship forged between our families carries on. And there is so much more that carries on. There is so much of Linda that carries on in her scholarship, in her teaching, in her mentoring, and in her colleagueship. And that is what we're here today to celebrate. We celebrate these ways that we have been touched by Linda, by her fierce intellect, her dedication to principle, her hard work, and her deep, deep compassion. In so doing, we honor her memory, and we hope to keep alive the very best qualities that Linda evoked in each of us. Our program follows the arc of Linda's time as a graduate student, researcher, teacher, mentor, and lifelong soulmate. I will let each speaker place themselves on that arc. And thank you for coming today to share your reflections with us. Thank you. My name is Eric Spolo, and I'm the chair of the Economics Department of Tufts, and uh, on behalf of the department and my colleagues, I welcome and thank you for joining us today at this celebration of Linda's wonderful life and uh, outstanding achievements. I'd also like to give special thanks to our colleagues, uh, Lynn, Dan, and Yannis, for uh, organizing this memorial service in cooperation with uh, Glenn. Now, I have the honor to read the reflections that were sent to us by William Sandy Derrick, Professor of Public Policy, Economics, and African and African American Studies at Duke, who was a fellow graduate student with Linda at MIT. I understand that Sandy won't mind that these reflections will be read in an Italian accent. <laughs> so now these are his words. I first met Linda Dutch Lowry when I started the PhD program in economics in fall 1975. I believe at the time she was a second year student. I actually was scheduled originally to have been in her court, but I had gotten a Marshall scholarship and went off to the London School of Economics in fall 1974, deferring enrollment in MIT's program until I completed the Marshall. Now, I had a great time in London forging friendships that lasted this day, but I was a wholly undistinguished student at the LSE. In fact, I had the tendency to go to the library and read whatever interested me. At the time, I was absorbed with disequilibrium macroeconomics, rather than preparing for the material that was going to be covered on the exams. So I decided to come back to the States at the end of the first year of the Marshall to join a comparatively large group of black scholars doing doctoral degrees at MIT. The community included Linda, Glenn Lowry, Samaya Suryu, Julian Malvo, Darius Manns, Sylvia Roberts, Ron Ferguson, Ron Mincy, and Virgolino McGuarter. I know that I'm probably forgetting others who were there when I first entered MIT, but we were the community that emerged in the aftermath of the department's commitment to engage in affirmative action, to transform aggressively the demography of the department. This experiment was temporary, so temporary in fact that years later, a number of people told me that MIT had just graduated its first black PhD in economics, Caroline Hoxfield. <laughs> I think 1994, Caroline. I believe that uh, Sam Myers was the first black American recipient of a PhD in economics at MIT. It was either Sam or Glenn. Actually, it was the same year as the paper, 1976. But I'm fairly certain that Linda was the first black woman to receive her PhD in economics from MIT. Linda combined a razor sharp intellect with absolute tenacity. If you presented an argument in her presence, you'd best be well prepared to defend it. And then, if you wanted to make sure you had a strong argument, it always was useful to run it past Linda. You were unlikely to get more severe and substantive criticism from others with whom you share your work. We both share a deep interest in understanding the dynamics of black-white inequality, although our frames of emphasis were different. Linda tended to find the sources of racial inequality more deeply embedded in pre-market factors, while I tend to find the sources in the persistence of discrimination. Our work converged in more recent years as we both came to explore the effects of a particular form of racism, skin shade penalties, or the phenomenon of colorism. She also shared my view that life outcomes for any of us possess a fragility that we economists might describe as densely path-dependent. She used to relate the story of the two Lindas, herself and a neighbor of the same name, who both displayed great intellectual promise at an early age, but whose lives took very different routes. Her neighbor Linda's life unfolded tragically, placed with early pregnancies associated with difficult lives for her children, drug addiction, and poverty, while Linda Dancher became a prominent scholar, a loved wife, and the mother of two accomplished sons. 
I think much of Linda's research agenda was prompted by her effort to better understand the divergence in life experiences of the two Lindas. But we also converge in another context. Both of us attended a convening held by the New York Fed, initiated to encourage talented black and Latino high school students to consider the economics major as undergraduates with an eye towards eventually becoming PhD economists. I thought Linda was incredibly wise and effective in communicating with the young people. I also had been serving as Director of Diversity Initiative for Tenure in Economics, DITE, at Duke, a mentoring program su supported by the National Science Foundation for junior faculty from underrepresented groups to provide them with support and guidance in moving towards becoming tenure associate professors. So I asked Linda if she would serve as a mentor for DITE, not realizing that she was so seriously ill. It was at that point that she informed me that she had been fighting with cancer for several years. She agreed to serve with the proviso that I would have someone stand ready to serve in her stead if she simply couldn't make it. She came to the gathering with the fourth court of Dalit Fellows, June 16, 18, and despite her deteriorating health, was a fully engaged and devoted preceptor. Glenn told me recently that her involvement with Dalit was the last major professional activity she had to I know that she is irreplaceable as wife and mother, but from the perspective of the community of Dite scholars, both the fellows and those of us who serve as mentors, she's also irreplaceable as a colleague and advisor. Hers was a life well lived, but I know that I'm deeply sad that she's no longer with us. Thinking about 
trying out domestic banking as a summer internship. She encouraged me to try it. Why not see what the private sector is like? See how it works. You should try it. When I thought about graduating a bit early from Tufts and going straight to an academic PhD program, she encouraged me to slow down. Um, take advantage of the opportunities in front of you. There's plenty of time. So for me, what I'll always remember about Professor Lowry is that when I knocked on the door, knock, knock, she always said, come in. She always said, come in. When I was a student in her class, when I was just a student at Tufts in other classes, when I was a research assistant in India, thousands of miles away, it was always coming. Um, and she was just so generous. She was generous with her time, um, and her pa generous with her time and her passion, her ability to share her passion for economics, but her passion for teaching and leading and guiding, and also encouraging. She was encouraging to persevere over problems, both academic uh, and personal, and to take risks try new things. And so she always led me by asking the deep questions, by showing the way, showing the alternatives, rather than just explaining and telling them. And I certainly believe that I would not be on the path I am today if I had not had Professor Lowry as a teacher, as an advisor, and a friend.